Chapter 7 Civil Crusade As the group makes their way to the entrance of Cayuga Village, they came across a huge arched gate with bars that led to the city. Through the gate are tons of tall concrete buildings and streetlights leading down the narrow roads. Finally, we made it, said Warren from the back of the group as they took their first steps into Cayuga Village. Yeah, we did cut it kind of close supply-wise, although we have been out for a day and a half, stated Karina. Whose fault is that? asked Cole in a patronizing tone. Yours, blurted out Lamont almost instantly. Ha <laughs> I like this kid. He says what's on his mind, says Jax. Yeah, because that's not annoying, replied Cole in a patronizing tone. Will you guys shut up and let's find a place to rest for the night, said Warren. New kid hasn't said three words to me the entire trip. Now I'm kind of wishing he was mute, said Cole in response. Sorry, I'm not as buddy-buddy with new people as you seem to be in this fucked-up world. But I intend to live for as long as possible, and to do that, I tell as little as possible to those who don't absolutely need to know. Honestly, if it weren't for your friends here, you wouldn't even know my name, he replied. Fine. Warren, was it? I had no intent on being BFFs anyway. If you don't want to speak up, that's cool. Karina and the kid were the same way, although they didn't just tell me to shut up, so they're nowhere near as close as you to getting their asses kicked, responded Cole aggressively. All right, you two, put your dicks away. The pissing match is over. Let's just find a place to crash before we all say something we probably mean, said Karina as she led the group to the nearest hotel. Cole took notice as the villagers, hidden inside their homes, glared with uncertainty at them as they walked in the open at night. Thinking nothing of it, he went on about his business until they made it to the hotel. Inside, the manager appeared unsettling, with uneven short gray hair and ratty clothes that smelled of mothballs. And as they paid their fee, Cole noticed a cross burned into his forearm. Although filled with curiosity, Cole could tell now wasn't the time or place for questions, so he followed the group to their room. After a couple of minutes of wandering, he followed suit with his companions and slept clean through the night. And before long, the morning sun was peeking through the window shades. All right, you bums, it's time to get up. We gotta head to the market, which apparently all the locals say is a huge decrepit building they call a mall for some reason. Now get up so we can find out about this mall and then hit the road again. Besides, checkout time is 7.30 a.m., and I'm not wasting any more cash because you guys need your beauty sleep. If you ain't got it by now, then you're just gonna have to be ugly for the day, yelled Cole as he attempted to wake Karina, Lamont, and Warren from their slumber. After about five minutes of yelling, Cole was finally able to wake everyone and check out. The group then headed for the marketplace to pick up supplies. Once there, they came across a cute brown-haired Caucasian girl with buck teeth and tattered clothes, who pulled Cole's pants to grab his attention. Excuse me, sir. My name's Amanda. I don't mean to be a pain, but you see, since our village has been on the brink of a civil war, our orphanage has closed down, and prices for everyday items have risen, and, well, I really just need a few coins to help purchase food for me and my friend. Anything you offer would be much appreciated said Amanda timidly as she pointed over to her Hispanic friend, who laid on the ground with ratty rags over him as he appeared to be on the brink of starvation. Cole looked over and sighed before giving the girl five silver coins. Wow, thank you so much, sir, the girl cheered. Name's Cole, kid, and it's fine. Those Lorenzia coins are probably only worth two silver coins here, but it should be enough to eat. Just hurry and feed your friend, Cole said right before he received a swift shove from Warren. What do you think you're doing giving away our resources like that? Asked Warren. First off, next time you put your hands on me will be the last time you use your hands. And second, don't worry, it's coming from my share, responded Cole sternly. He then covertly instructed Jax, who had unsheathed one of his swords behind Warren without anyone recognizing, to settle down. You guys go on ahead and get supplies. I actually have a few questions for the girl. Cole told his crew as he tossed a bag of coins over to Karina. Fine, but we'll be ready to go in about 20 minutes or so, so get your ass in gear, responded Karina as she caught the bag and took off with Lamont and Warren. Hey, kid, 
I've noticed everyone in this village appears to be on edge, between people peeking out their windows frightened, and others appear ready for a fight to break out any second. Does it have anything to do with what you said about Civil War? What actually is going on in Cayuga Village? As Cole, seemingly full of curiosity. Um, well, you see, Cayuga Village used to be a barren wasteland, but a large group of the religious community wanted a place of their own, so they built Cayuga Village. For years, this place was a religious town for Christians who turned away no one. The problem came when the accepting village of Cayuga allowed in a few too many rich, non-believing developers to expand their vision of what Cayuga Village can be. With those developers came their family and friends, and before long, Cayuga wasn't just a religious village. It was split down the middle. Years passed, and religious people still sought out Cayuga as a place to dwell. But it now has a majority of atheists living in it. As things got worse and times got tougher, the Christians grew more self-righteous, while the atheists grew to hate the Christians' ever-present optimism and holier-than-thou attitude. The non-believers began to grow violent and take their pain out on the Christians of the village. Before long, the Christians found themselves persecuted for their beliefs, and today one might say we are on the brink of a civil war. Or is it a crusade? Or maybe civil crusade? Either way, you get my point. The normally non-violent Christians, having banded together, decided to burn a small cross, not only to identify their true believers, but also as a sign of ultimate faith even through persecution. Unfortunately, that only made them easier targets. By now, they've taken so much abuse that they're at their breaking point and just looking for an excuse to take up arms in self-defense, responded Amanda. Wow, so this place is a powder keg waiting to blow. That actually explains a lot. In that case, i better hurry back to the gang and get out of here before this place blows. But first, are you sure you and your friend will be okay, Amanda? asked Cole. Well, my friend Josh has parents and a place to stay. They just tend to forget about feeding him, and I'm sure I can sleep under a bridge or something, but I'll be fine, replied Amanda. Nonsense. Get your food. Give Josh his portion, and then you're coming with us for a while. That is, if you want, replied Cole. Really? I mean, yeah, sure. I guess it's, that's cool, replied Amanda as she tried to stay calm. Cole then walked Amanda to the bread market, where they got loaves of bread, and walked one back over to her friend, then went searching for the rest of the group. As they came across the group, they saw Karina in the middle of an altercation. What the hell is everyone freaking out for? I mean, she sneezed, and I said God bless. Jeez, said Karina as she walked out of the building. We have enough of your kind as it is. Get lost. You're not welcome in my store. And take the kid with you said the owner of the store as he kicked Lamont from behind to expedite his exit, knocking him down in the process. See, now I'm going to have to kick your ass in front of all these nice people, said Karina as she elbowed the owner so hard in the face he flew into his buddy next to him. With that act of aggression, a fire was lit under everyone nearby, and atheists who saw joined the fight. The Christians, needing any excuse to take up arms, rushed in as well. Before long, the streets were a battlefield. Your what? said a nearby man out of the blue as he shoved a man with a cross burned into his face, into Cole. Hey, watch where you're shoving, said Cole as she shoved the man back, knocking the first guy into a nearby cart. Um, hey kid, do you have any idea why all the Christians are so keen on displaying their crosses on their face? I mean, getting it somewhere concealable would just be as effective and way less hostile, given this town's reservations to religion asked Jax, who popped up behind them from out of nowhere. Amanda freaked out for a second before responding. Oh, didn't see you there. Well, Mr. Stealthy, over the years, Christianity in this town has become somewhat of a cult. And the cross, their symbol of persecution, they claim to wear it on their face to show their pride. However, that's not the only place many of them have it. You see, they believe higher positions in their community have earned the right to burn their sins away with what they call God's cleansing burn. So people of high rank have several crosses of all sizes burned all over their body. Sorry if it seems like I was giving you half-truth earlier, Mr. Cole. I didn't just think you guys would be here long enough for any of this to matter. You're good, Amanda. You don't owe me anything. Even if you did want to hold something back, that's your right. No need to be anxious. I'm not going to take the money back. 
As for the cross thing, it's not only an identifier, but also a battle cry. They are saying we, the oppressed, should unite in the name of the Lord and defend our beliefs, said Cole. Though, that Mr. Stealthy's name is Jax. He whispered surprisingly playfully for their current circumstances. So there really is a civil war taking place because of a town's divided beliefs? This is kind of unheard of, claimed Jax as he looked upon the pointless violence and shame. Either way, we gotta get our people and our supplies and get the hell out of here, replied Cole as he grabbed Amanda by the arm and began to make his way through the market, avoiding huge piles of people brawling in the streets. Hey, where do you guys think you're going? This is a fucking battlefield for the soul of our city. You can't afford to sit this out. Get in there and whip some ass and take the city from those Christian pricks. Shouted a crazed man while standing on top of a man with a cross burned on his cheek. This adrenaline-fueled stranger shoved Cole and Amanda into the heart of the street where the brawl was most intense. Before long, the two were lost in a sea of people. Jax immediately swung on the man, dropping him like a ton of bricks before relentlessly searching for Cole and Amanda. However, just as Jax spotted Cole, a lady reached out and unsheathed one of his swords from a strap across his back. Jax was torn as to whether he should go help Cole or go after his weapon. After all, weapons such as his came only but once in a blue moon. After a brief second of thought, he gave chase to the thief who nabbed his sword, working under the assumption that Cole could handle anything thrown his way for the time being. He was right. Cole was able to defend both himself and Amanda with ease, pouncing on anyone who came near them with the swift thrust of a viper, be they Christian or atheist. Unfortunately, it didn't take long before Cole got the attention of both groups, as he indiscriminately took out anyone in his way, making himself public enemy number one by everyone in what was now a mosh pit of people. As both groups began to focus their attention on him and Amanda by proxy, those who he defeated got up aggravated and reached for anything they could use as a weapon. It didn't take long for the first strike to land as a monkey wrench came flying in, smacking him across his back. With weapons now involved, coming from every which way, Cole could no longer guarantee the safety of Amanda, so instead of fighting back, he laid on top of her and hoped his abilities would pull him through this beating. Cole survived. He had endured worse. However, even with his abilities active, the mob of people were able to knock him unconscious. It didn't take long for the crowd's attention to revert back to each other with Cole down. Amanda crawled from underneath Cole and attempted to drag his beat-up body to the side, but was kicked and stomped on several times in the process until finally she was able to rest his body on the edge of the sidewalk. It's not safe here, Cole. Come on, wake up. We gotta go said Amanda as she began to slap the face of Cole in an attempt to wake him. Hey, you're that girl from earlier, right? Oh shit, is that Cole? asked Lamont as he came across Amanda. We got thrown into the heart of the fight, and Cole risked his life to save me. We gotta help him somehow, pleaded Amanda. Well, let's get him inside quickly before the fight expands further. Warren, give me a hand, said Lamont. All right, I'll grab his head. You get his feet, and let's get him inside. Then we can go looking for Karina like we planned, replied Warren. Is the lady you were with missing too? Because the guy who was talking with Cole, I, I think he said his name was Jax, got separated from us as well, said Amanda as she walked defensively alongside the guys. We'll do a quick search for him later, but Karina is who's important here. She has all our coins on her, claimed Warren. Come on, dude. Even I know that's kind of a dick move. I mean, if the only person safe in our group in your eyes is the person who holds the coins, then you're basically saying you'd leave us all for dead the second we inconvenience you, and saying shit like that will get your ass left to fend for yourself, said Lamont. Hey, maybe I'm being a little harsh, but you have to be to survive in this area. I mean, for goodness sake, just look around you, man. This world is seriously fucked up. They are literally having a battle to the death because they believe in different things, said Warren as he looked around to the wounded and deceased. That may be true, but if you can only rely on yourself, never trusting even one person, that's truly an empty existence. If you are living an empty life, are you truly living or are you just existing in a void of nothingness? Asked Amanda. What would you know about it, kid? You're like, what, ten? replied Warren with a patronizing tone. 
Actually, I'm 12 and a half, but that doesn't mean I'm dumb when it comes to how people operate, especially when I have first-hand experience in the matter. My parents were killed by some bad guys who wanted what they had, all while their so-called friends stayed hidden, not saying a word. They watched my parents get beat to death, so when I was brought to the orphanage four years ago, I thought, what's the point in having friends? They just fuck you over. I went three years without friends, keeping to myself. It was like I was living in darkness as time passed. Days started to blur together. It became painfully lonely as I found myself holding conversations with myself. Then one day, I met Milo. Looking back, I think his loneliness sought out a similar pain. He's the kid I got food for earlier. His parents put him in the orphanage while they attempted to get clean. He was also lonely, but he managed to worm his way into my life by coming to talk to me every day about every little thing that happened to him. And at first, I thought it was annoying. But when I yelled at him one day and he actually stayed away, I realized I missed him and his annoying stories. It was the only part of my day that didn't feel like a never-ending void that I was doomed to repeat. I made up with Milo, and even though the orphanage got closed, we're still friends to this day. Just trust me, sir. There aren't many Milos out there. People won't just keep coming to you, offering help or friendship, and when it's gone, it'll feel like you're not even living, responded Amanda with sage-like advice way beyond her years. All right, all right, you may have a point, sort of. We can look for Jacks too, all right? But I'm not really in the mood to be lectured by a child, so either way, let's get a move on. For starters, how about we wake Sleeping Beauty here, said Warren as he dropped Cole in an attempt to wake him. What was that for? asked Lamont. Well, how else did you plan on waking him? It's not like we got smelling salts on us or anything, so he's probably going to be out for a while. That is, unless Prince Charming here was planning on planting one on him, Warren said sarcastically. Shut up, dumbass. I actually took something from the market that I think may help in this situation, responded Lamont. Wait, when did you... Warren began to ask, interrupted by Lamont. When things took an ugly turn in that guy's store, one of the guys in there bumped me into a shelf of medical remedy stuff, and I just grabbed the item that I was knocked into, explained Lamont. Yeah, so what? You tripped, slipped, fell, and decided to steal the closest thing you could touch. You're lucky this riot broke out, or the storekeeper would have called for your head, man. You know they don't take stealing lightly, right? Said Warren in a patronizing tone. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure they have bigger things to worry about today, considering that same store is currently on fire, responded Lamont as he saw smoke engulf the building. Lamont then pulled the pill capsule from his pocket and shoved two down his mouth. Seconds later, Cole popped up with a burning sensation. Ugh, what the fuck was that? Shouted Cole in confusion as he popped up from his slumber. It was a ghost pepper in pill form, and if you think it burns going down, you're in for a rude awakening later, responded Lamont. Guys, I'm pretty sure we got bigger issues. This brawl is turning volatile and spreading throughout the whole village. They started a fire at the market, and Karina and What's-His-Face are still missing, said Warren. Wait, the market's on fire? asked Cole. Yeah, man. They just set fire to the store we were in, connected to that huge complex they call a mall, and it won't take long for it to spread, responded Warren. Okay, here's what we gotta do. Since we don't have time to search for Karina, and the marketplace will literally be up in flames any minute now, we're gonna raid the store and take what we need. Then we'll go looking for the others, stated Cole decisively. Maybe we should split up and do both. That way, said Lamont before he was interrupted by Cole. Not yet. If we do that out here, we'll just have another person to look for. And if we get engulfed in this battle one by one, the chances of all of us making it out alive are slim. Don't worry. We'll go looking for Karina immediately after. But first, we gotta be smart about this. Now help me up real quick said Cole as he extended his arms out, and both Lamont and Warren pulled him up. With Cole up, the group bull rushed their way to the marketplace, keeping Amanda in the middle of them. All right, we run in on three. One, two, three, yelled Cole as he kicked the door of the flaming building open. The mall was designed in such a fashion that the first two stores were connected together with one leading into the next. The path leading from store to store was narrow, and the intense smoke made it difficult to both see and breathe so close to the fire. Once past the first two stores, the mall began to open up, and the connected stores were further apart, and the surrounding area opened up. 
which gave Cole and the others a chance to breathe again without inhaling smoke. The mall consisted of over 45 stores, all of which sold very niche products and was covered in a huge concrete dome. Lamont and Warren were amazed by what they saw, but Cole knew there was no time for childlike wonder and immediately took control of the situation. Okay, now that we're in, we have very little time, so unlike before, we're going to have to split up now that we are away from the fighting. We should split in groups of two. Lamont and Warren, you two go search all the stores with preservable foods. Anything in a can will do. Here, you'll need this, he said as he reached in his pocket and pulled out the infinity cube pressed the button, and clearly and succinctly said the word, bag. As their bag came shooting out the cube, growing as it exited, Cole grabbed it and put the cube in one of the bag zippers. Here, fill the bag as much as possible, and when you're done, put it back in the cube so no one sees you. Wait, why can't we just use the cube instead? asked Lamont. Because they were built to hold only one of each particular item, as to prevent confusion when storing similar items, replied Warren. Exactly. Cole responded before continuing. Amanda and I will search for any medicine that might help us on our journey. We'll meet back here in five minutes, so be quick. Oh, and if by chance you see anyone, avoid fighting at all cost. We really don't have the time. This place will be ash in fifteen minutes and unbreathable in ten, yelled Cole promptly, and the two groups went their separate ways with their duties clear. Warren and Lamont went to the left passing several specialized food stores and clothing stores before finally coming across a store that sold produce and canned goods. Finally, quick, grab as much water as you can and bring it to the bag, and I'll get the canned food, said Warren as he and Lamont spent the next three minutes filling the bag. Okay, the bag is filled to the rim. We should probably go. (coughs) Meet up with the guys, said Lamont as the smoke began to engulf the store they were in. The two then began to run back to where they split up. Meanwhile, Cole and Amanda frantically search for medical supplies until they finally come across a pharmacy on the other end of the mall. By now, smoke covered the entire mall, and the fire spread halfway through the mall, engulfing their entrance. I found the pharmacy, said Amanda as she tried prying the door open. Oh shit, said Cole as he looked up and saw the ceiling begin to crumble over Amanda's head. He swiftly grabbed Amanda and tackled his way through the glass door at the pharmacy store entrance in one fell swoop. The fallen debris covered the entrance as the fire blazed on with each second passing, burning the hopes of escape. Quick, grab what you can. Anything that may come in handy, like anti-poison pills, burn ointment, stamina pills, and shove what you can in your pockets. What doesn't fit you can put in this cart. Cole said as he dumped out everything stored in a handheld cart used for storing medicine on their counters. After a few seconds passed, the two loaded not only their pockets, but two handcarts worth of items and soon needed an exit as the room quickly filled with smoke. (coughs) Stick to the ground. The smoke will kill us in a matter of seconds if we just keep inhaling it, shouted Cole as he dropped to the ground and began crawling for an exit. Wait, Cole. I don't think this place has vents said Amanda from the ground. So what? asked Cole. Well, they have the restrooms in the back, and I've been in this mall before because of Cayuga's year-round calm temperature. This mall doesn't have a way to stay cool, responded Amanda with excitement in her voice. Again, I say so what? We are kind of running out of time here, and you're getting delusional on me, responded Cole in an upset tone. Well, with the bathroom all the way in the back, how do they let this place air out? without stinking up the whole store, questioned Amanda. Amanda, you're a genius, shouted Cole in excitement as he burst his way into the female bathroom. We're gonna need this, said Cole as he ripped the napkin dispenser from the wall, emptied the napkins, turned it upside down, and put all the medicine they gathered in it. When he was done, they rushed to the back where they found a window. By now the flames had spread into the store and were making their way to the back. Cole grabbed the inside of the napkin dispenser and used it as a rock to smash through the window, dropping it on the outside in the process. Cole then knelt down so Amanda could leap off his back and into safety. She did so with nary a scratch. Meanwhile, as the fire made its way to the bathroom, Cole backed up so he could have some room. If I don't nail this, I'm fucked, said Cole aloud as he took a big gulp and then ran at full speed to the window, diving face first through it. Due to Cole's size, he narrowly fit through the window, scraping his sides on leftover glass on his way through. 
With both he and Amanda making it through, they quickly grabbed the napkin dispenser as they watched what was left of the mall burn. I hope they <coughs> got out okay and didn't <coughs> wait for us at the meetup point, <coughs> said Amanda as she backed away from the flames. Me too, but we don't have time to <coughs> sit here and hope. We gotta hurry and find everyone so <coughs> we can get the fuck out of this crazy town. Not sure I would have <coughs> come up with this whole window thing without you. You may be a valuable new member <coughs> to our crew yet, said Cole as Amanda couldn't help but smile through her charcoal-covered face. Nearby stood a stout, six-foot-three Caucasian man with black gelled back hair and a crisp black-on-black -black suit. His face was clean-shaven and his chin square. He happened to notice Cole and Amanda escape the fire, and once he got a clear look at Cole's face, he could barely contain himself. The mysterious man took one look at Cole and fought his way back to his comrades, who appeared to be enjoying themselves in the brawl. Found him, he said in a deep, gravelly voice. That's great, Brad. You go grab Scotty and I'll finish up here and get Weasel. Then we can send word to the boss that Cole's alive and in Cayuga Village, he said as his comrades were now separated, some taking on all challengers and joyously knocking them out left and right. After all the men finally got together, they enjoyed their handiwork, as they covered the street they were on with hundreds of unconscious citizens, before the four of them finally got on their horses and rode off.